So I think we should start. And during one of the parallel sessions today, it's a session on uh, edit value of downscaling. And I think all we know that the edit value, still we have many discussions actually about what the edit value is and how one can define this edit value for downscaling. And the first speakers, speaker in our morning session is uh, René Laprise from the University of Quebec and Montreal. So he will give an, some kind of it's invited speaker. So he giving an overview a little bit more about the edit value issue and as well showing some example from North America. So welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the organizer for this opportunity to present about this topic. Um, it's a fairly old topic, actually. It's something that comes back to the beginning of regional climate modeling. So I'll try to start my talk by making a little bit of a review and show in a rather subjective fashion what we think we're looking for when we talk about added value. Then I'll show examples of simulations made at three resolutions over North America, uh, showing what can be gained. And to do that, I will look at uh, six specific um, processes where uh, I believe we can show that there is gain uh, by increasing resolution. So just to, so that people who are not uh, specialists in regional modeling know what we're talking about, uh, this is term in the field as dynamical downscaling. So the idea is that we use a very high, well, high resolution regional climate model. Regional means that it's not global, uh, but otherwise its formulation is fairly similar to global model. And because it's regional, then we need to drive it at lateral boundaries by data that comes either from a low resolution global model or from reanalysis, depending what we want to do with it. Um, the, uh, it's good to remind ourselves that uh, still today, despite the increase in uh, computing power, global climate models still have fairly courses, coarse meshes. Um, and I made this little statistics about the last uh, AR5, um, that uh, centennial climate change projections were made with models which grid uh, mesh uh, span the, uh, the values from 139 kilometer to 476 for an average of 321 kilometer. And you'll note that these numbers are much larger than what you often hear or read in papers, and that's because people confuse all models together. So there are models that make simulation only of 10 years, but these are not of interest if you want to do centennial simulation. Uh, by comparison, uh, regional models were initially with grids of 45 to 60 kilometers, and that's been used for uh, the last three decades almost. Uh, in recent years, we've seen quite a few models running at 15 kilometers, especially over Europe, and there are dev developmental convection permitting models now that are being tested and show some promising perspectives. So what is being gained that we expect from high resolution? Well, from a numerical point of view, it's reduced numerical truncation because we don't solve the exact equation but the discrete form of it. Uh, this gives more accurate uh, uh, approximations of equations, hopefully. Uh, more realistic representation of surface forcings like orography, lakes, rivers, and uh, you know, land sea contracts, which uh, some of them are on a small scale that's too small for course model to, uh, to, to see. And there are some mesoscale weather processes which are explicitly resolved, like sea breezes, for example, and lake effect, snowstorms, and things like that, local winds that uh, would be impossible with coarser meshes. So the expectations, what we call the added value of RCM, is that the increased uh, resolution will improve um, upon the data that's driving the model. So part of the added value quest is to compare the solution of the RCM with its driving data. And the other component is to compare it with observed data to show whether it's actually good, not just different. 
Uh, but really, is there added value? So, in order to illustrate a little bit uh, the, the perspectives, I'm going to show you a few slides from what I call virtual reality of climate models. So I'm going to show you um, a few days of the MPI model. It's a T63 spectral model, and if you compute the equivalent grid, it's about 317 grids. And I'll be showing a downscaling version of it with our model at uh, 49 kilometers. And I'll be showing you a few maps spaced at 12-hour interval. And I've produced these maps to look a bit like weather maps. So I'm superimposing here three fields the relative humidity at 700 millibar, so it's sort of a proxy for clouds, uh, the 850 uh, hectopascal temperature in red, you see the ribbons that show where uh, essentially uh, fronts would be located, and the 1,000 hectopascal geopotential in blue, so you see the low pressures. So here is a, a map. Um, they're not quite synchronous, and that's typical of regional uh, climate downscaling. But you see on the left the band of clouds, which uh, are actually fairly broad uh, here, and the gradients of temperature are fairly slack, where on the regional model, there are much tighter gradients. And 12 hours later, of course, the system moves. And again, here it's quite obvious that the front here is much sharper, and it's starting to look like... Uh, uh, a s uh, satellite map um, that's even more striking in here. And every time you look, you see that the gradients, the sharper gradients in temperature, which are associated with fronts, the clouds, and so forth, and the depth of weather system are always uh, sharper in, um, in regional model. And I think if you were to live in the GCM world, the climate would be quite different than it would be if you were to live in a regional model world. And I would argue that the, um, it's quite obvious for any uh, synoptician that the one on the right uh, is more realistic. Whether it's right, it's something else. So uh, the conclusion I want you to remember from here is that maps of regional model, even at 50 kilometers, look more like weather maps than they do in a GCM simulation at 300 kilometers. There are sharper gradients, front-like features, uh, more intense precipitation associated with fronts with increased resolutions. So I would say that in, from some point of view, there is some obvious added value, um, although it needs to be quantified. Next, I'll show you the average of one month, one December month. Uh, again, using the same um, uh, superposition of the three fields. And here you get a completely different perception that if you look at the two, in fact, if I didn't have a label, you might not be able to know which one is which. So the point is that as soon as you time average these things, uh, it's very difficult to see any gain from the added resolution to the one of the right. So the conclusion is that for monthly averages, or even more for climatological fields, uh, an RCM simulation at 50 kilometers is essentially, in quote, indistinguishable from a global model at 300 kilometers. There is no outstanding value unless one looks very closely, and I'll do that in a moment. Um, so the added value in regional model simulation has been very hard to verify with observation because, for one thing, there are very few high density climate networks, except maybe in Europe, uh, and even less uh, gridded climatology of variables. Um, it's been very difficult to identify in simulated climatological fields, because time average removes most of the fine scales that we saw in snapshots, um, except possibly for stationary features associated with uh, surface forcing. Then one has to look closely to find those. And typically, what's been done, and including in my own group and elsewhere, is to do a scale decomposition of the field, to so try to isolate um, the fine scales, which are of smaller amplitude in climate fields, from the larger scale, which have larger amplitude. Because if you don't decompose, the fields are dominated by the large scales, and you have little added value from the fine resolution. This has been done by many groups around the world. Um, so I guess the conclusion is that there is a lack of clear examples where RCM are outstandingly better than GCM, except possibly for some very specific fields. And if you know, the challenge had not been so high, there would not be this session here 30 years after starting to do regional models. 
So it's good to remember that until rather recently, most regional models use uh, grid sizes of about 50 kilometers. So the question that we ask ourselves is, what about added value at higher resolution? So in the next in the last part of my talk, I'll be showing a comparison of simulations uh, that are driven by reanalyses um, at three resolution, um, which are nominally uh, 0.44, which I'll call 50 kilometer to make it simple, 0.22 degrees, which I call 25 kilometer, and 0.11, which I call 12 kilometer. And of course, as we know, the cost increases tremendously uh, if you keep the domain the same, when you increase resolution, it goes like the, uh, the cube. So um, the time step has to be reduced, and there are more grid points. So the cost ratio, as you see here, goes to 64 times the cost of running a coarser resolution. So typically what one does is to increase the number of CPUs, but uh, normally you cannot increase as in the same proportion. So the time, actually, the wall clock time does increase as well. <clears throat> So what I'll be looking at are six specific features uh, over North America, um, which are uh, shown on this diagram. So I'll be looking at mountainous uh, area over the west coast here, the northern west coast of US and Canada, uh, where I'll be looking at precipitation and snow. I'll be looking at uh, the, uh, the snow belt around the Great Lakes. Um, the uh, North American monsoon, uh, sea breeze um, in uh, the uh, Florida Peninsula, and some winds that are specific to the St. Lawrence Valley. So let's start with orographic precipitation in the U.S. Northwest. So here I'm showing you here the maps obtained at uh, tree resolution, going from the coarser to the finer resolution. And at the bottom I'm showing you some analysis in quote of observation. ERA, of course, is a reanalysis, but the precipitation is not an analysis, it's a byproduct. There is a CRU uh, at 55 kilometer mesh, and there is this uh, data set called NAOBS, which are at 10 kilometer. Um, so the thing you see, first of all, is that there seems to be an excess of precipitation um, as the model compared to any uh, kind of reference. And it's still, for me, a bit difficult to note to which extent this is an apparent um, excess or whether it's real, real, because stations are not located at random um, and they tend to be in valleys. Um, so that adds to it. Uh, the coverage is not necessarily uh, that great. But one thing is for sure is that if you go away from the coast uh, and look more inland toward the continental divide, you start to see a lot more details as resolution increases. And probably the best reference would be this data set, which is the highest uh, resolution data set. And I think um, it's not hard to convince oneself that if you start to look at some of these details here, they are starting to show at 22 and uh, 11, and they were relatively coarsely represented uh, on this here. So I think it's, to me, it's quite clear that we start to see something quite interesting at uh, 12 kilometer that uh, we didn't have at, uh, at 50. Now, associated with precipitation, of course, is that in winter or this region, the high, um, uh, topography results in a uh, larger area which is at low temperature uh, and hence I'm showing you here uh, the snow water equivalent um, in February at the tree resolution and we see quite an increase um, in details and in an amount in some cases and if you compare say with this data set uh, which is at one kilometer it's uh, quite amazing, actually, how some of the details, like uh, this arc here, which I wouldn't know exactly the name of the topography it's associated with, which is resolved, actually, in, uh, at uh, 12 kilometer, and which is very badly represented at coarser resolution. And uh, even some other small-scale features here are uh, perceived. Um, Again, it's good to remember that measuring snow is a challenge, so even the NSA reference here is not necessarily the truth, but um, it gives, I think, a hint that uh, we do have uh, some gain with higher resolution. So another snow-related thing is the snow belt around the Great Lakes. So the process is as follows. 
until the Great Lakes are frozen, um, they do evaporate quite a bit when there is a cold outflow, and typically this evaporation results in uh, increased water vapor and even convection at times, and as the, this moves over the uh, adjacent continent, it results in snowfall, which can be very, very large. I mean, amounts like one meter of snow in, uh, in half a day is not infrequent. Um, and here are um, the snow water equivalent on the ground um, in February at the tree resolution. Um, and you have to look very closely because these snow belts occur on very small scale. And actually, they occur on a scale which is smaller typically than 12 kilometer. So one has to think, keep in mind here that what we see is sort of a blurred version of the reality. And the analysis of the phenomenon is, is very poor. Uh, in Canada, we have a very poor analysis of snow. In the US, uh, we see here the, uh, um, the snow accumulated downstream of Lake Ontario uh, in Western Europe, uh, Western, Western <laughs> New York, uh, and also south of, the, um, of Lake Superior. Um, and also, if you look in detail here, you have um, the Champlain River Valley, which is lower ground than the adjacent uh, mountains, the Adirondack, and you see that this phenomenon is, is seen at higher resolution, it's absent at coarser resolution, and you know, with a bit of imagination, you see here the, the snow belt that occurs downstream of the lakes, uh, but which is very poorly represented, in, or not at all, at coarser resolution. So again, it's a case here where uh, observations are very weak in some sense, but we get a sense that uh, um, increased resolution does improve the simulation. North American monsoon is a phenomenon that occurs in the U.S. southwest here, uh, and it's characterized by a huge increase of precipitation from a very, very small amount until June, and then in July and August, it really increased by a factor of six, nearly. And here, there's shown two observational data set, uh, an observational station and some uh, analysis, gridded analysis in uh, black and orange. You see the huge increase. And if you compare with uh, model resolution and even era reanalysis, that you see that as the resolution increases, there is a gain in, in the peak, although even at 12 kilometer, we haven't reached uh, quite the peak um, as observed, but I think anyone would agree that there is a huge improvement as resolution has increased. Um, the uh, simulation of North American monsoon, of course, um, depends on several things, including the land sea mask and the sea surface temperature uh, contrast, and this is, of course, improved as one um, goes to higher resolution. Summer precipitation over Florida is characterized by a strong uh, land sea breeze, uh, so a convergence uh, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Atlantic Ocean over Florida, which results in uh, cumulonimbus and uh, precipitation. And you see that the model does see quite an increase of uh, precipitation uh, in summer um, over land. Uh, again, this is rather poorly observed. Probably the best data set is this one here stage, which is a combination of land station, um, well, stations, I should say, and radar. Um, um, and I think it's fair to say also that the model exaggerates precipitation, um, but <clears throat> the geographical distribution um, certainly is improved. We've also looked, in this case, at uh, wind pattern uh, and wind uh, variation during the day, and uh, the perception we get is that there is an improvement with higher resolution. And finally, my last example is something close to home. Um, in the St. Lawrence River Valley uh, is, uh, has adjacent two uh, mountain uh, systems that are not very high. I think the highest peak is about 1,000 meters, so it's nothing like the Alps. But it seems to be sufficient to produce winds which, in observation, tend to align along the valley here. Um, and if you compare with simulations of models here at three resolution, the coarse, the middle, and the fine resolution, you see that, that the coarse resolution, just like ERA, 
Um, it has dominant westerly wind, which is the nearly geostrophic wind, but as resolution increases, then you s tend to see the wind lying with the valley as uh, is observed. And this is rather important because in winter, this is associated with freezing rain because the northeasterly wind, this branch here, uh, is very important to bring the cold air uh, when you have actually warm air going um, on top with uh, an approaching warm front. And here is a frequency intensity distribution of wind speed, and one sees, as the arrow shows here, that uh, as resolution increases, you tend to get more frequent high speed winds compared to low resolution uh, simulations. Uh, and era as well. So I think there there is a very clear uh, improvement with resolution. So in conclusion, uh, if we ask the question, do regional models really add value or is it worth doing high resolution simulation? I guess uh, for this continent uh, and with this model, I would say yes. Um, it's, there's a clear gain going from 50 to 25, less clear going from 25 to 12. Um, in some cases, uh, and the interpretation is that we have a better simulation of fine scale or mesoscale phenomenon. Um, it's more realistic simulation of local processes, and I think this is important when one intends to use this for impact or coupled models, such as uh, coastal erosion, which are all phenomenon which uh, are uh, vary on a very small. Um, spatial scale, or hydrological model where the intensity uh, is very important, it's not just the average. Uh, even more if you try to drive, say, a glacier model and something like that. The modest improvement from uh, 0.22 to 0.11 we interpret as uh, resulting possibly from the fact that this model um, was initially developed and tuned for numerical weather prediction at uh, with a grid mesh of about 33 kilometer, which is about between these, uh, the resolution, the coarse and the medium resolution. So most likely there's a need to retune to some extent when we go to 0.11, which we haven't done intentionally here. So in this study, it's important to remember that the RCM simulations were driven by reanalyses, um, and it would be most likely uh, quite a lot more challenging uh, to try to see the added value if we drive with a GCM simulation, which by definition is imperfect. Uh, and we have to remember that uh, GCM, in this case, provide not only the atmospheric lateral boundary, but also the ocean surface boundary. And I do have a poster uh, at lunchtime uh, showing the great effect that uh, wrong or uh, inadequate surface ocean temperature can have uh, for the case of the West African monsoon. So thank you for your attention. There is a paper that is being submitted, and if one of the bad referee eventually accepts to let it go, it will get in print eventually. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, René, for a very good presentation. So now we're going to questions. And I think we have many questions. Okay. <laughs> so about resolution. Uh, so at this time, resolution, finest resolution, is uh, related to our technical abilities. You stopped at 12 kilometers, and uh, this is very difficult resolution because uh, so horizontal scale is of the order of uh, depth of the atmosphere. Uh, convective parameterization should not work very well. Uh, so in addition, when, for example, you talk about uh, breezes, uh, I doubt uh, at 12 kilometer breezes are resolved. I have a lot of difficulty to hear you well. I don't know. There's, so do you the question hear? is about can you resolve breezes with 12 kilometers? Could I, could I, uh, should I say just, uh, I, I'm saying that uh, you use uh, for comparison 12 kilometer, and this is difficult resolution. Do you hear me? Yeah. So basically, question is, can you resolve, for example, breeze <laughs> circulation with 12 kilometers resolution? No, it's not uh, no? the only question. Let me repeat. Okay. Uh, so I'm saying that, uh, so for comparison, we use uh, the finest resolution, 20 kilometers. And this is difficult resolution because parameterizations probably do not work well, convective parameterizations do not w work well for, for, for this resolution, right? 
uh, so it is already fine enough and uh, uh, so and not fine enough to, 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 to resolve convection. And the second, uh, when you talk about breezes, I doubt uh, breezes of Florida are resolved at 12 kilometers uh, because fine scale of breezes is not resolved. So that's uh, probably additional uh, uh, so question. Uh, so if we will go further, uh, probably uh, improvements of fine resolution will be seen much better if we will, uh, say, uh, move to uh, cloud resolving resolution. I'm not sure what breeders are. See breeders? No, um, about breeze. Breeze, land breeze. Yeah. yeah. So in, if you're going to a higher resolution, True. convective permitting, for example. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, land sea breeze occur on a fairly small scale, just like uh, for the same thing with the, uh, the snow squall around the Great Lakes. So, you know, it's partly parameterized in some ways, partly resolved. Um, and, you know, it's a bit like, I would say, model which are called now convection permitting, they're not convection resolving. So I would say that the same with uh, the breeze, that um, it's, uh, it's permitted in some sense, but it's at the very limit of the grid mesh. So it's, uh, if you look at numerical <laughs> consideration, it's very poorly modeled in some ways. But the point is that you start to see it that, uh, with the 12-kilometer mesh, which we didn't really at 50. Uh, but of course, it's still under resolved. If one is really interested in that, you have to go to one kilometer, most likely. I'm not sure if I'm answer your question, but okay. So, Linda, thank you very much, Renee, for your presentation. I don't hear you at all now. So, that really, <laughs> shall I speak louder? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I was trying to be gentle. Um, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, one being um, whether or not you think you'd expect to see more or less the same added value with different regional models, or do you think there could actually be a fair amount of variability with different regional models at the same resolution? So that's question one. Question two is then uh, interesting, your statement that the, there's only modest improvement between 25 and 12 kilometers, uh, whereas in Europe, it seems as if there's a real emphasis that you get a lot more of added value at 0.11. Um, so I'm wondering why there seems to be that different perspective. Um, is, it, is the perspective on the advantages of a high resolution um, over Europe and the North America really based on different features and climate processes in the two different eras? Or is it really more a function to the fact that in Eurocortex, no simulations at 25 kilometers were done, and so of course you see improvements from 50 to 0.11? Are those questions more or less clear? Maybe? Yeah. Well, you, you're raising several points here, yeah. uh, indeed. Um, I think each model may react differently. Um, I would even think partly this depends on the numerical scheme used, for example, whether simply it's Eulerian or Semilagrangian does have some bearing, possibly, on the sensitivity to resolution. Um, and also, uh, for different continents and different processes, I think the sensitivity to resolution is not the same. For example, our experience with changing from uh, 45 to uh, 22 kilometer over Africa, basically, the first order, we couldn't see any effect, despite a, an increase which is substantial, a factor of eight in computing costs. Um, so over Europe, I cannot comment. We haven't done it. Uh, but I think um, different regions have different uh, processes. Um, you know, weather system over Europe, from what I know, are quite distinct from those we have in North America. Um, and, uh, you know, topography, of course, is, is also part of that as well. Uh, but my point is that even over fairly flat land, like uh, over the St. Lawrence River Valley, which, you know, we have to look closely to see the mountains, um, we do have an effect which is subtle in some ways, but is important locally for some processes. But it's a good point you raise these things, Linda. 
Okay, so we have one question right here, and then moving up. <laughs> uh, <coughs> can you hear? No, yes. Uh, it's actually a comment, two comments on, this, on the two previous questions. Uh, on the issue of the sea breeze, actually many years ago, uh, we did some simulations of sea breezes uh, with the MM4 back then over Florida and I, at 10 kilometers. And actually at 10 kilometers, we did some fairly detailed analysis. You can actually see the sea breeze. Um, so it's just to sort of <coughs> address this point that I think the 10 kilometer scale, of course, is not uh, perfect, but you definitely see some sea breeze circulations and this uh, convec convection at the sea breeze front. Uh, the second is about this issue of the 12 versus 25 versus 50. Over Europe, actually, we did this exercise, not in Cordex, but uh, <clears throat> there was a previous um, project called Ensembles, where the models were run at 50 and 25. Uh, and I remember back then, uh, Sarah Rasher wrote a couple of papers on comparing 50 and 25, and we were somewhat disappointed by the lack of the improvement that we were hoping in different metrics. Uh, but then going to 12, um, in the Euro Cortex, you actually, and I will show something later, and I think more people will show something, there is a huge improvement. So. Um, Somehow, this over Europe, this 25 kilometer resolution did not seem a, uh, a you know something worth doing. Because I mean, 12 is definitely worth doing, I think, but 25 is an intermediate. The, the value is not so large. I don't know if others agree, but thank you. So it was more like comment. A comment. It's comment. Okay. Okay. So maybe we can have a short questions. Just. Yeah, because we're already running a little bit out of time. <laughs> Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, uh, you showed very nicely an example of added value of RCM over GCM, or reanalysis, but it was, it was only for one model, only one regional model. We all aim to do ensembles. So what worries me, if we include more regional models, Aren't we going to lose some added values in these fine details that you showed we gain when we increase the resolution? Do I understand correctly? You mean that as we increase resolution, we have to do fewer simulations and then the ensembles get smaller? Yeah. Ah, I see, I see. Okay. Well, one thing is just to do like doing an ensemble has several components. One is that you do the ensemble average, and then that tends to smear things out. Uh, but at the same time, you the ensemble provides you with uh, the uh, the breadth of solution, which gives you an estimate of uncertainty. Um, but I would my point is that in some ways. Um, and that's also the dilemma with, with running, for example, either uh, several very long coarse resolution global model simulation to get the largest possible ensemble to get the most uh, robust statistically significant results, which are crap, <laughs> sorry, uh, or else to do fewer, they're less statistically significant, but you get a sense that they're closer to reality. And, um, you know, I come from the world of global modeling myself, so I think I'm allowed to be critical. <laughs> but uh, I think the aim now is to try to do something which um, start to look more like the real world and not just, uh, you know, computing data for computing data. Um, so, you know, the, the dilemma is still there because, you know, the factor 64, which I showed here in this model, one has to think, you know, uh, do you really want, for example, or do you need to solve for an entire of North America, which for us, for example, is at the limit of our computing resource? My idea now is that most likely you want to make simulations which are rather specific to some region and to some uh, processes. For us, it might be the St. Lawrence River Valley, so it would be running over eastern north of North America, uh, rather than be running over the entire North America, which is tremendously big. Um, so, um, I think 
one has to realize we have to get to run to smaller domain for one thing, uh, which reduced the cost tremendously. Um, and um, this was one of my criticism initially of Cortex, that uh, you know by insisting on running for continents, this prevents you from running at a resolution which you'd like. Um, of course, you know as you run over smaller regions, you'll have more groups or that has to be involved, and that makes it more difficult to integrate the data. But uh, I don't think I've answered your question just because I cannot, really. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I saw much more questions, but we should move. So please, just discussing everything during the coffee break. So thank you, Rene, one more time. <laughs> so we're moving to next talk by Silvina Solman from the University of Buenos Aires. And now we're continuing looking for the edit value in South America, moving from North America. And uh, here. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to be after Rene's talk because it's easier to explain what uh, the the idea of added, added value uh, in this uh, particular um, presentation that I will um, discuss with you. So the idea is to search for added value, but not looking at the uh, special uh, variability or special features, but in terms of uh, temporal variability. So uh, what I did here with a, with a, a colleague uh, is to try to answer this question. Uh, so we, we, we want to know if the regional climate models are able to reproduce the main patterns of precipitation variability over South America over different temporal time scales, temporal scales. So uh, we went from interannual through intraseasonal, synoptic time scale, and uh, some extreme events. In order to see where the, the main question is, if they add value compared with the driving GCMs, at which scale we can say that they, they really do. So the the observed data used for this evaluation comes from the CPC Unified data set, which is a, month, a daily data uh, covering the period from 1979 to 2025 um, in a 0.5 degree res resolution, and also the precipitation data from uh, GPCP, monthly data on a low resolution. And then the analysis was uh, focused on three different regional climate models. Um, one is the REMO model, um, driving by the EC5. It's an MPI model uh, belonging to the last semi generation, semi three generation. Uh, and the other two models are from the uh, RCA. Four, driving by two different global models um, from the semi five uh, generation under the Cordex uh, data sets available. So what I did here is to compare the different patterns of variability uh, uh, given by the driving models and the regional climate models to see whether where the, the this added value can be uh, identified. So. The analysis uh, has been performed uh, for the interannual time scales. Uh, there are two metrics to uh, identify or explore the variability. One is the standard deviation of monthly, monthly anomalies of rainfall, and the other is the, the empirical orthogonal factions in order to identify the main patterns of variability. So uh, after uh, performing this, uh, this uh, EOF analysis, I choose just the first, the main, the main pattern and the 
the, the other metric concerning this main pattern of variability is not only the um, spatial distribution of these uh, uh, centers of action of the uh, empirical orthogonal functions, but also the percentage of explained variance of these main patterns compared to the total variance. So that is uh, the sort of methodology for the interannual time scales and also for the intraseasonal and synoptic time scales. But in this case, um, obviously, the, the, the precipitation data analyzed was daily. Daily anomalies were defined. And after that, uh, the, the, these daily anomalies were filtered in order to retain the intraseasonal from 10 to 90 days and the uh, higher frequency or synoptic scale frequencies for 4 to 10 days windows. And then again, the E of F analysis. And finally, extreme events. Uh, looking at the empirical distribution of daily precipitation in order to see exactly uh, the, what is usually seen. Uh, the analysis uh, here is uh, um, just from the warm season in the southern hemisphere, which is from October to March. So let me quickly go through the, the main thing, which is uh, the mean climate. Uh, mean precipitation patterns. Uh, in the, your left, you have low resolution uh, data sets, observations and models, and the, in the right, you have the high resolution data sets and uh, regional climate models. And uh, this uh, picture I'm just showing because I would like to highlight that, that uh, this is a typical monsoon. Um, season in the South America during the, the, the warm period. And you, you, you get here this uh, uh, large precipitation over the, the central Amazon basin and also some more precipitation over what is called La Plata basin area. Uh, from the, um, the, the, this uh, global model, it uh, has a fairly good representation of, the, of this mean precipitation pattern. Uh, but the, um, the regional model has some problems, mainly uh, underestimating precipitation over, over the central region of Amazon and over the La Plata Basin too. And uh, again, you see uh, no much differences between the mean precipitation as, as seen by the global models and the mean precipitation as seen by the regional models. So, Definitely not added value can be um, identified here. So let me go through the variability. So when we go to the interannual variability, we know that the drivers of the interannual variability are remote forcings. So, and if the global models has uh, uh, strong patterns of these uh, uh, forcings, uh, then the regional model will not be able to do a better job. So uh, these are the, the standard deviation uh, spatial pattern of um, interannual variability. And here you have the first, the main pattern of interannual variability as uh, given by the EOF, the first EO, uh, EOF. So uh, here you can identify these uh, three centers of action. Uh, which are mainly associated with the impact of the ENSO forcing over South America. Uh, and, and here you can see, uh, well, when it's it, uh, positive anomalies here are related with negative anomalies here and positive anomalies here, uh, or the opposite in, the, in case of uh, a La Nina event. So what happens with the, with the ICHIC model? Well, it seems like it sort of kind of uh, try to capture this uh, variability pattern, but it, it doesn't do it so well because you see that uh, this uh, main anomaly over the northeast on Brazil is uh, not well reproduced. Uh, and so the regional model driving by this model is not very good in uh, reproducing this interannual variability pattern. Um, if we go to the other two models, um, the MPI and the EC5OM models, uh, both from the Max Planck Institute, they do uh, capture very well this interannual variability pattern and the regional models, uh, if, you, if you see 
uh, here, the RCA model, it, it, uh, it is a little bit better than the, the, the other version, but it's not, still not really good in capturing this uh, variability pattern. Uh, and the, the Remo model is uh, doing a fairly good job, but the um, center of action in northeast Brazil is not captured. So uh, we can't really say that in the internal variability time scale, the regional models are doing better. And we didn't expect that, uh, really, because uh, the, the, the main forces should be well um, uh, captured by the GCMs in order to uh, translate that information to the regional climate model. So let's see what happens in the intraseasonal uh, time scales. So the intraseasonal time scales, um, there, there is a very, very nice um, um, pattern in South America, which is this known CISO pattern, uh, in which we have uh, opposite anomalies over the La Plata Basin area and the South Atlantic Conversion Zone area, this. So it's a very, very well-known pattern, very studied. And uh, the, 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 the point is to see whether these uh, uh, models can capture this uh, pattern, which is mainly associated with anomalous regional circulation patterns. So uh, if you look at the different models, um, the iCheck model, the RCA4 driving by this, we find that the pattern is fairly well reproduced. Uh, mainly these CISO patterns, maybe they fail in reproducing this other anomaly here, but this CISO pattern is fairly well reproduced, and uh, so is the, the CISO pattern reproduced by the regional model as well. And uh, in this other model, again, we can say that though the, the anomalies uh, in the regional models in the, both in this regional model, is, uh, they are uh, really um, underestimated. The pattern is uh, fairly well reproduced, and the same can be said from the, the last model. So uh, if, if you look at any of these global models or any of these regional models and compare also the percentage of explained variance with the observations at its uh, a special scale, low and high resolution, we can say that the regional models are better than the global models here. Uh, and what happens with the high frequency variability? Uh, again, in the high frequency variability, uh, well, during the summertime, we can expect fronts coming from the south, uh, southwestern and going through this area that can explain these two uh, bands of positive and negative anomalies of, um, even in, in, in summertime. And some uh, cyclonic activity over this, uh, this area which can explain these um, uh, anomalies over the tropical part of South America. So uh, this is what we, we see. This is the, the main areas of variability in the, at the, this uh, synoptic time scales. La Plata Basin is one of them. Uh, regions which uh, have uh, uh, more variability at, at the, these time scales. And if we go again through the different models um, in this uh, uh, temporal window, uh, again we can see that the global models reproduce fairly well this pattern, main pattern of variability, and so the, the regional models also can be able to reproduce, although with some uh, uh, underestimation in the, in the um, uh, intensity of, the, um, of these um, main centers of action of uh, this uh, EOF pattern. And again, uh, the, other, the other metric that is evaluated is related with the percentage of, of variance explained. And you see that the global models tend to overestimate the percentage of variance explained by this first model variability compared with observations. And this overestimation is larger than in the regional climate model. So if we, if we try to um, summarize this analysis, uh, this just shows the rate of the explained variance uh, of the main pattern of um, variability uh, from models 
compared with observation. So it's the rate between those explained values. So if the rate is one, it means that the model has the same ex uh, amount of explained variance in, in the first mode as observation. So uh, the line one should, it means perfect models. And the field colors are for regional models and the hatched are for global models. So you can see here that there is no any um, uh, preference of regional models being closer to the one than the global models. In fact, that they are not. And this is expected because this internal variability, as I mentioned before, is driven by large-scale remote forces and is mostly GCM control. When we go to the intra-seasonal variability, again, as uh, the, 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 these uh, bars, uh, as they are far from the line uh, indicating one, means that they are not good in reproducing this variability. And again, we can say that the regional models are better than the global models. And in this case, uh, is maybe due, um, maybe due to this, um, this uh, intra-seasonal variability is driven by regional scale circulation anomalies that are present in both GCM and RCMs. Uh, when we go to the synoptic scale variability, uh, here we can see uh, a sort of um, improvement. Uh, the, the regional models are closer to, to this black line than the global models for the winter time and except this model for the summer time too. So here we can just uh, uh, identify some, some added value in the higher frequency. Uh, this is, uh, I, I have to finish, but uh, this is a very, very common uh, uh, figure which shows um, the precipitation uh, density distribution uh, the daily precipitation frequency for La Plata Basin, and you, you see uh, field circles are re regional models and open circles are global models. It is not so clear, and the black is observation. It is not so clear in La Plata Basin that the regional models are better in this, in this um, metric, but mainly because the, model has, the models uh, used to have a very strong underestimation. When we go to the South Atlantic Conversion Zone area, Area, we really see that the global models, these are really far away from the black line, which is observation, compared with the regional models. So, uh, no, I don't want to take more time, uh, but the issue is that uh, in this, um, in this uh, analysis of uh, temporal scale variability, the added value is uh, find, it's found from the synoptic scale to the higher frequencies, and obviously in extreme events. So thank you. I'm okay. sorry for being too Thank long. you very much, Servina. <laughs> so we have time only for one short question. More questions? Uh, just, just a quick question slash comment. You didn't say anything about the Patagonian precipitation, for instance, uh, which is a very large region of precipitation in, in the southern tip of South America. Mm -hmm. I think that region actually uh, it's better represented in models than in the data. Uh, mm -hmm. The GCPC satellite data actually uh, underestimates apparently Mm -hmm. precipitation and nobody knows exactly how much precipitation falls there because it's very difficult to measure mm -hmm. uh, it falls uh, over the glaciers at yeah. 3,000 meters so nobody puts instruments there or the instruments cannot keep up uh, with the precipitation just mm -hmm. yeah well uh, that 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 is one of the reasons why I didn't mention the precipitation over the southern Chile and the western uh, South America, because uh, the, the data sets are very uh, non, are not re reliable there, so it's difficult to see if the model are doing well or not. 
Okay, thank you. So we should move to next talk. And next presentation is by Alessandro, Alessandro Di Luca from Climate Change Research Center, University of New South Wales in Australia. You do it. <laughs> So good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm presenting a work we've done with um, Daniel Argueso, Jason Evans, Ramon Delia, and René Lapris. Um, and so I start by things that we all know. It's uh, an essential requirement for regional climate models is that they improve some aspect of the climate compared to GCMs, to, in fact, to the driving data. And so basically, this is what we call that they produce some added value. Um, the thing is that um, the search for this added value, so past studies, have shown that no univocal gains. And the finding of mixed results, basically the finding of some things that are improved and others that are deteriorated, it's more the standard, the norm, than uh, an exception in added value studies. So one question that we can ask is, which of these situations, whether we improve or whether you de we deteriorate, is more dominant? And this is basically asking, overall, can we say that the regional climate models are improving over the driving data? Um, in some way, we can think as the analogy when we compare SEMIP3 and SEMIP5 ensembles, and we really look for the overall added value of the ensemble, not really if every single model improves upon the uh, older version. <clears throat> so the objectives of, of this presentation is to evaluate the overall added value of a, an ensemble of regional climate model simulations over, over Australia and to uh, study the dependence of, on a variety of factors that I will define later. Um, we also, uh, I will also present uh, what's the contribution, so where is this, coming, this added value coming from? From different uh, larger large scales, basically those scales that are common to both the RCM and the driving data, and a smaller case, those that are only represented in the, in the uh, RCMs. And finally, I will briefly address whether some of this added value can be obtained using some uh, simpler uh, post-processing methods. So I first uh, will define a little more precisely what I mean by added value, and basically we are going to use two measures. Um, the first one is called, I call it, uh, mean square error metric, and it basically um, um, shows, uh, is, uh, makes the, the difference between the error in the driving data compared to observations minus the error in the uh, regional climate model compared to observations. So whenever this quantity is positive, we said that there is some added value. Whenever it's negative, it means that the error in the RCM is larger than in the driving data, and it's uh, negative. Um, the second metric that we are going to use is uh, based on the spatial patterns or how models or the driving data re represent the observed spatial patterns, and it simply calculates the spatial correlation between the RCM and the OBS and minus the spatial correlation um, between the driving data and the OBS, and whenever this quantity is positive, again, we are talking about some, the existence of some added value. Um, all these metrics are normalized in a way that they vary between minus one and one, um, and this is because we are going to compare across a large range of variable seasons, regions, etc. so we want them to, uh, to be normalized. But again, positive added value, negative deterioration. And so what do we mean by overall evaluation? And the idea is that we are going to sampling systematically over different factors that influence the added value um, and we separate br uh, roughly these factors according to two different main types, those that are related with the experimental setup and those that are related with the calculation of statistics. Um, so in particular, for example, the added value is going to depend on the resolution, resolution jump between the driving data and the RCM. 
And here in this particular ensemble, we are considering two different uh, resolutions, 10, 10 kilometers and 50 kilometers. We are also considering three different models, although they are three different versions of the WARF model, and we also calculate the ensemble mean from these three. And finally, we are um, driving all these simulations by three different uh, driving data. One, it's the NSEP and carbon analysis, and two GCMs that correspond to the SEMIP3 ensemble. We also, this is the domain of simulation, so the large domain is the 50 kilometer domain, the small domain, the black square there, is the 10 kilometer domain, and the analysis is based over the common region between the two domains, uh, particularly over land where we have good observations. The uh, climate statistics that uh, we use, or the factors that we want to study there, are how this added value, for example, depends on the season we choose, and this is the classic definition, how the, it depends on the particular region that we are analyzing. So we, have, uh, we separate grid points on those that are close to the coast, those that are characterized by some complex topography, and also those that remain, which call them flat. We consider three variables, and this is basically a limitation of the observations we have. So we have minimum and maximum temperature and precipitation. And finally, we calculate three different statistics, trying to um, um, span the, the whole PDF in some way, the temporal mean, the temporal standard deviation, and the 99th percentile to see a little what's, what happened with the with extremes. And so in the end, what we end up is that for each uh, metric, so the mean square error and the correlation, we end up with 2,600 estimations of the added value. So all the combinations we can get from here. And so I start to show some results, and what I'm showing here is um, results for the mean square error metric. And what, you, what we see is uh, that the overall added value for different factors. And so basically, what, for example, if we consider the season there, we have four different values that correspond to the four different seasons. And the way we obtain each of these values is that I uh, consider, for example, winter for all the regions, all the resolutions, all the models, etc., and I calculate the mean that was obtained from the added value before. And so what we can see is that uh, there are some, the choices of some factors that will affect the added value that we obtain much more than others. Specifically, for example, if we consider the variable, what we see is that there is a large added value re related with the temperature variables, but it, there is a small deterioration of the precipitation variable. <clears throat> also, if we consider, for example, the driving data, what we see is that the lowest added value, as probably expected, is uh, obtained compared to the NSEP and Carver analysis, and the largest added value compared to the um, Canadian GCM. Another important um, choice is, is related with the region, and this is, again, this is quite well known. So the largest added value is associated with regions, with coastal or topographical, or regions where the topography is complex, and the lowest with the flat regions. <clears throat> overall, what we see is that the added value is positive. So basically, overall, the RCM ensemble is adding value over the driving data. If we look at now the spatial correlation, what we see is, again, that overall there is an improvement, and it looks like way more consistent than what we obtain with the mean square error. In particular, even if we consider now the all variables, the precipitation is still the one that um, um, with the lowest values, but the, now it's positive. <clears throat> um, for example, now we can see that if we compare different, for example, the mean, the standard deviation, or the more extremes, for the spatial pattern in specifically, this, the temporal mean looks like is the variable that we are uh, gaining more. And the standard deviation that it tends to smooth out a lot of fine scale information in the space is the one with the lowest uh, um, values. Um, as with the mean square error, I didn't mention, but the 10 kilometer resolution, so this is about the resolution, the 10 kilometer model always improves or adds more value than the 50 kilometer. Um, in the case of the mean square error, the difference was quite small. In the case of the correlation, it's a little higher. <clears throat> and so then the idea was, okay, let's 
try to see where, from which scales this added value is coming. And I have to explain a little this plot, but basically what we have in the top is the total added value that I was show, showing before. And this total added value, for example, this point here, is the sum of the contribution of different scales. This one plus this one plus this one plus this one. And this 300, in fact, is uh, um, denoting those larger scales. 50 kilometer is the 50 kilometer scale, 10 kilometer. And then for the mean square error, we have a, a covariance uh, term that appears. But the main result here is that um, the whole added value in the case of the mean square error is coming from the larger scale component. Basically, there is um, negative or pretty much zero for the 50 and 10 kilometers scales. On the other hand, if we consider the, the correlation metric, what we find is that the whole added value is now explained what, by the fine scale information related with the 50 kilometer grid mesh. And so here we see a, a, an important difference between the added value in the mean square metric and in the correlation. The correlation really needs the, the fine scale information, while the other one is not, uh, not explicitly, at least. Finally, I wanted to touch um, briefly on this uh, issue, what we've done. So all the results I, I showed before were uh, performed by comparing the RCM with the GCM when the GCM was interpolated in the RCM grid using a nearest neighbor approach. And someone can say that that's a little unfair for low resolution models. So what we've done is we perform all the calculations using a bilinear method in, instead of a nearest neighbor, and also using, in the case of temperature, a bilinear plus a topographical correction that is simply a correction about how the temperature varies with elevation using a, um, the standard lapse rate. Very, very simple stuff. And what we see here, so, is the mean square error in solid, 10 and 15 different colors, and the correlation uh, in dashed. With, for the minimum temperature in flat regions. What we see is that there is no much so. Always diminishes, the added value diminishes as we interpolate the GCM using a little more sophisticated stuff. But for the flat region, there is not a very large change. However, when we move to regions where the uh, topography is complex, both metrics, the mean square error and the correlation, really decrease a lot. In particular, the correlation um, goes from 0.2 to something like um, um, eight times smaller. So it looks like a large part of the added value for the temperature variables can be obtained using a very simple post-processing method. And so I conclude here. Um, so we show that overall, the RCMs, they produce better results than the, than the, the driving data. And that looks like more, much, way more consistent for the spatial patterns than for the absolute values. <clears throat> we also show that the, the mean square error is related with larger scales, while the, correlation, the spatial correlation pattern, we really need explicitly the fine scale information. And we show that a, a, a large part of temperature um, related variables can be obtained using some very simple post-processing. Um, I think this is the, the place to also raise what, what would happen if we do a similar analysis in a much larger and comprehensive um, um, ensemble like uh, Cordex in Europe, where we also have way better observations. And so looking forward to see um, if we obtain the same general results. Um, this was published in um, uh, last year, this is this paper here, and there is a few other references there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So we have a time for one short question. We are already a little bit behind our time schedule. Thanks a lot for this pr um, very nice presentation. Uh, just a question regarding, um, well, added value in terms of climate change. So if you would take, I don't know, Ed Maurer's bias corrected data sets from GCMs, they would look just perfect uh, in present day climate. Um, but if you would um, apply them in a future climate, we would know that they would be wrong because um, they don't reserve 
any small scale variability of the climate change signal. I think you mentioned this problem already in your paper, but wouldn't we have to move to that discussion about added value? Because you can statistically post process everything which looks perfect in present climate, but we're interested in climate change. So the, my idea with this post-processing wasn't really make, uh, making a statistical downscaling, and, um, but was um, uh, a bilinear interpolation is, I mean, it is as fair as a nearest neighbor, for example. And, and the other, it's um, the elevation correction, it's, it's statistically related in the sense that the lapse rate is a statistical quantity, but it's a physical process in the sense that we know that we, when we go up in the atmosphere, um, temperature diminishes. So in some way, it's a, it's a physical, a very physical statistical uh, correction. I agree that um, um, for climate change, what, what we want is that we base, I, I think, more in, in the physical processes. But um, um, yeah, I don't know if, about the, the added value in the climate change signal, um, I think the only, the only thing we really can um, talk about is how much fine scale information in the climate change signal we find. And uh, we cannot really assert about how good is that information in principle. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we're moving to our last talk in this early morning session. So it's uh, Michel Nikiema from uh, West African Science uh, Service Center on climate change and the adapted land use, Vascal in Burkina Faso. Just put it. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm happy to give uh, this talk and thank you for the invitation. My presentation is about uh, multimodal CIMIP-5 and codex simulation of historical summer temperature and precipitation variabilities over West Africa. And I will just talk a bit ab about the WASCAL program. It's uh, defined by West African Science Service Center on Climate Change and Adapted Land Use and it is funded by German Federal Ministry of Education. And we have uh, a lot of graduate school over West Africa trying to tackle the um, climate change challenges. For example, uh, I'm from the West African Climate System. The university is based in Nigeria, but you have some eight others uh, specialties like climate change and water resources, climate change and economics, climate change and agriculture. Just to say that it's dealing with impact studies most of the time, and we need data for that. So what we try to find out here is to look from the data set we have already, how, I mean, what is the picture over the, the region? and uh, with uh, different uh, CIMIP phases. We recently have what they call codex, and we are trying to find out if there is uh, added value by, I mean, there is, all, there, there is always added value by downscaling. And how will we do that? We got uh, something like 29 CIMIP-5 GCM, and from the 29 CIMIP-5 GCM codex downscale, we got, I mean, 16 codex SCMs, which have um, downscale 9 CIMIP-5. And we use uh, observation like GPCP crew and UDL to do some comparison. And uh, even if we take the, take the 16 codex LCMs, LC4 itself has uh, eight, um, has downscale uh, eight uh, GCM. So we we'll try to figure out, uh, I mean, uh, the picture uh, of those different data sets over the region. And this is the domain of the study, mainly focus of, on West Africa. And we sub, 
we, divide, we divided it in three subregions, the whole box for West Africa, and uh, uh, the Sahel in the middle, and the Gulf of Guinea. So um, we took advantage of the uh, added value metric defined it by D. Luca, who presented this um, just now, just to find out how, um, um, what is the added value? I mean, spatially, by looking at the data spatially, we got some uh, box plots to appreciate the intermodal spread, and we end up uh, by doing some um, EOF analysis to appreciate the spatial temporal variability. So this is what we get from the, from the temperature. We have uh, up there the crew, UDL, and we have the CMIP5, the whole 29 uh, models, multimodal ensemble. We have the nine uh, subset, and we have the, the codex. And we just do some, uh, we choose one of the observations to do just some, um, calculate some biases. And uh, we added here the, uh, trying, uh, we added the, the, the added value here. Because to, to, for, from this formula, we need the, the CMIP, we need the observation and uh, the driving GCM. And uh, here we are trying to show from the temperature, for example, what is the added value by downscaling the nine, um, uh, the nine uh, uh, GCM, and what is the added value if we have downscaled the, the 29, the whole 29. So the first one will be the circle. If there is an added value, we throw a circle. Compare, this will be compared to the subset, but the plus will be uh, compared to the, it is the added value compared to the CMF5, the old 29. And we can see that for temperature, I mean, uh, we are not improving much. And this one is for the precipitation over the same region. And uh, we can see that at least for the precipitation over the region, we start to get a good picture. And uh, by downscaling the temperature, we highlight some cold biases. And uh, the precipitation, we have some improvements, but Codex is coming out with uh, some fine uh, spatial details due to the resolution. Maybe. Here we try to uh, see the, uh, the intermodal standard deviation just to see the spread about uh, the different uh, models. And uh, we try here also to see this one is uh, the CMIP, uh, uh, this one is for temperature, and the, le the right side is for precipitation. And what we try to figure out here is the, 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 up, the first figure is for the 29, the spread among the 29 uh, models, the uh, spread about the nine models, and uh, this one is the whole 16 codex. But we added, uh, since SCA4 itself downscale up to eight, we try to appreciate what is the impact of the boundary conditions. And uh, uh, EC Earth has been downscaled by four different GCM. We try also to appreciate. And we find out that this one seems to be the best in terms of uh, reduction of the spread. And uh, it's, here it's just a summary also uh, like a box plot, and it's, it's giving the same information. Here we are trying to see 
we have the, the intercultural range. And uh, for CIM5, the subset, the codex, the SCA4, and the, the ECF. And uh, we put the mean uh, for the observation, the UDL and crew. And we can find that, by, but we can find that for temperature, mainly uh, SCA4 is doing well. And Codex is improving compared, if, if I take, for example, over the Guinean coast, Codex is improving compared to CIMIP 5 in terms of interquantile range. But for precipitation, it's a bit, I mean, it's a bit better, especially over the, um, the Guinean coast. But, I mean, for some regions, it's not too much clear, but at least for the LCA4, the picture is really clear. So, so here we just move to the um, interannual variability to appreciate the, for, for the temperature here. We did uh, some empirical orthogonal function, uh, rotated AOF mainly, and we used the, the UDL as observations, and generally the first three modes explain more than 70% of the variance, so we just keep the first three modes and try to find out what are the models which are, I mean, at least reproducing the, um, the patterns. And we, mainly, we find mainly three modes. We have one called West African mode, uh, which is here. And at least this mode has been reproduced by the, the three models to some extent. We have also the Central Eastern Sahara mode and uh, the Western Sahara mode. And uh, for temperature, at least uh, the three models mainly capture the, the, the spatial pattern. And this is the, the PC, uh, the, um, the principal components for the... Um, for the temperature, and we can find out, uh, we can find that at least uh, for interannual variability, mainly for the temperature, at least we are getting uh, something uh, good. But for precipitation, we we got also for the precipitation, uh, how we call it, uh, the main uh, mode, three modes. But uh, it's not um, how we call it. For example, if I take uh, the CMIP5, uh, it's missed s some mode. I mean, but the main uh, idea of uh, modeling is just to let, uh, how we call it, to let them reproduce the, the statistic. At least uh, uh, we get an improvement um, from the codex one. And uh, this one is the associated uh, time series for how we call it, uh, the precipitation. And uh, what can we say? In summary, uh, we got some uh, biases, cold biases for temperature, but at least some little, I mean, some improvement for precipitation, and uh, we also find that at least the, all the multimodels ensemble capture with different magnitude uh, the first mode, and generally the, uh, how we call it, uh, for the principal component, uh, the modes, f I mean, they follow more the, how we call it, the pattern of the driving GCMs. And this highlights the importance of uh, having a large model ensemble and carefully design some multi-model approach 
I mean, to do some um, impact studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. So you have time for one very, very short question. Why are all your principal component loadings positive for the RCMs? That there's no negative loading at all, which is surprising. Okay. Uh, for which... Uh... Temperature? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. This one is... Um, uh -huh. What? Ah, okay, the special. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's like the models here because when we took the observations, at least uh, we have uh, generally, how we call it, uh, the positive and negative phase. But it's like the models almost, um, I mean, they, they are warmer. It's like, uh, they are not able to really capture the the cold phase. They may capture some to some extent, but not exactly as the observation is like a, a, a deficiency, maybe in the, how we call it uh, uh, in those models, because they were at least expect to show some patterns, but not uh, how we call it exactly. So I may say. Uh, it's uh, um, it's like um, overestimating. Uh, I mean, uh, the warming, something like that. Yeah. Now maybe you can check a little bit once more. Yeah. Yeah. All these calculations. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for the morning session. So now we're going for coffee, and we're already late. So I would suggest we should suppose to start at uh, 10:45, so we can take five more minutes.